Thank you for listening to When Everything Cracks, a memoir of old San Francisco and the mental health system of yore. Chapter two is about peer pressure. This is a chapter where I make a really bad decision because my friends encourage me to. Now, some people think this decision is what caused me to have a nervous breakdown, but I don't think that was it. I think that this was just one of many factors that led to this kind of ungluing of my brain. Anyway, here's chapter two, going down to the underground. When we get to the underground, the door scene is really tight. We know a bartender there named Rory, so we ask if he's in there. The doorman says we have to leave an ID if we want to go talk to him. I don't think it's such a good plan. In New York, they'd just let us in because we were way cooler than the bridge and tunnel troglodytes who go to the big clubs. But this town is small, and they don't do that sort of thing. Then we see Lola, her olive green eyes pinned and fluttery. She has a stamp on her hand, and she says, Come here. And we go down to Hama Street, and she spits so that the ink gets real wet and comes off her hand onto Donnie's. I can tell she likes Donnie better than me, or she would have done me first. Everyone likes Donnie better because he's so cool. It doesn't work quite as well on my hand, but if we go to the back door, they'll never check. We walk past the doorman, throw some attitude, and he half glances at the smears of black ink on our hands and lets us in. We were just another set of freaks to him. Downstairs, there's dancing and lots of little goth kids, even younger than me, who drove in from Burlingame in their parents' Buick Skylark. Lola sits us down and tells us she can get us heroin if we pay her up front. Donnie gets excited, but I'm still afraid. He pushes my shoulder and says, come on, you've always wanted to try it, and now I want to. He knows what's cool. I ask, can I get addicted from the first try? They both laugh. We go back toward the apartment in Lola's car. She pulls over on O'Farrell Street and rings the doorbell. She disappears inside the building with our money for a long time. When she comes out, she talks more slowly, and I'm pretty sure she did a little bump, and so is Donnie. But we don't say anything, because that's just how it works. Back in our apartment, there are no chairs, so we sit down on the piles of clothing. Lola goes into the kitchen and gets a spoon. We have a whole bunch of spoons, but hardly any knives and only two forks. Donnie lights a candle, and Lola puts a lump of tar that looks like molasses in the spoon. She heats it up with some water over the candle flame, making sure not to boil it. Why do you have to heat it up? I don't know. It doesn't work if you don't cook it. She says that if she goes first, then she won't shake and she can hit me up. That's a lie, but I don't say anything. She puts a belt around her arm, and I turn away because I can't watch. Then Donnie goes next. He gets a real serious look on his face, like I hardly ever see him, and when he lets the belt go, he exhales a long, slow sigh and turns to me and says he's glad it's so good for my first time. He's been beat real bad before, and this shit is really good. There isn't very much left in the spoon, but I won't need very much because it's my first time. I worry about overdosing. Before I use the needle, I say I need to bleach it. They both roll their eyes, but I go into the kitchen and there's some bleach under the sink that was there when we moved in. I put some bleach in the glass and clean out the needle a few times, then rinse it with water, drawing it up and squirting it out. When I'm done, the plunger won't move. It's too sticky. So Lola says, rub a little earwax on it. It'll make it slide better. I don't believe her, but I take out the plunger and rub it against my ear. Sure enough, it moves okay after that. She says that earwax is a natural body lubricant, so it won't give me cotton fever. I've heard of cotton fever. It's a terrible headache that makes junkies bundle up in a knot and shake. You get it from the cotton you use to filter the heroin, or that's what they say anyway. I have to stop thinking about cotton fever. I wrap the belt around my arm. Lola starts touching my vein and I can't watch, so I turn away. I hardly feel it go in. When it's done, I don't notice anything. It's because I'm holding onto the belt tightly. Let go. So I let the belt go, and everything goes warm and fuzzy. My thoughts, which usually come at me super fast, come hardly at all. I feel like on my journey home. I feel numb, not just on my skin, but in my head too. I wish dying felt like this. Maybe it does. I try to stand up, but fall back down on the pile of clothes. Donnie and Lola are just lying there, so what do I need to get up for? We talk softly under our breath about the universe. Lola thinks it's like a mirror. She says that whatever you hold up to it is what you see. I say, it's like a tiny speck of dust floating down from a rooftop heading toward a big barrel of rainwater. In a few million years, we'll all get really wet. 
Donnie nods out and doesn't say anything. I say that the stars we see are just views of our own solar system at different times because time folds on top of itself and we can see through it. Lola wrinkles her nose at me like she isn't following me. It doesn't matter. I'm hungry. I don't know how long we've been sitting here, but I think I just woke up out of a nod. Lola doesn't have much money, so she offers to take us to the grub steak. It's just a few blocks from here. It's an old diner in the shape of a railroad car. It's crowded with old trolls and hustlers. The yellow walls are stained with rust-colored grease. I can't taste my burger, so I don't finish it. I usually eat all my food. I'm not hungry either, which is unusual for me. It's as if everything is being taken care of and I don't need to worry about anything. After the grub steak, Lola drives us out to the beach to watch the sunrise. My nose is runny. The warm feeling is starting to wear off and I'm tired. The ocean looks like a gray smear. The sun rises from behind us so we hardly notice. The beach warms from gray to brown. I'm cranky. I do my best to hide it from them because they both look content. I have to get my check from the stud tomorrow. It's today, actually, and I haven't slept. I'll get it in the afternoon. We can ride the rails the next day. After an eternity, we finally drive back to the Tenderloin. I crawl into my closet and close the door. The earthquakes are really bad. I can hardly fall asleep. I'm shaking so hard. Donnie is snoring. I don't remember when I fall asleep, but it's almost evening time when I get up. I have to run down the street to the stud and get my check before the accountant leaves. I get there just as he's locking up. He shakes his head at me and goes in to get the envelope, muttering softly under his breath. They pay me $30 a shift. There's no bonus like I was hoping. So I have $150 to live on for three months while the stud is closed. Well, let's see. The rent is $375. How am I going to make $225 in two weeks? And who's going to buy groceries? Not Donnie. If I stay in town, I guess I'll be going to the soup kitchen on Waller Street. No problem. When I get home, Donnie is up and he's hungry. I go to the corner and buy broccoli, an onion, and a can of broth. I make soup from it. It tastes shitty. It smells like the garbage chute. I don't know how to make fucking soup. I put the rest of the soup in the refrigerator. Donnie wants fried chicken, so I go to the KFC on the corner and consider the cost of a bucket versus a box. I could put some chicken in the soup to make it taste better. At the KFC, an old lady sits in one of the brown plastic chairs, fingering a bruise on her leg. Her hair is matted, her face speckled with mud. She laughs and sings to herself. She says my name, Duncan. How odd. As her vocal cords hum and create laughter, I can hear some sort of message masked under the noise. She's telling me that the chicken is poisoned. I get out of line and thank her. I go to the bun me store and get two chicken buns. Donnie doesn't like them, but it's better than poison, I explain. Donnie ignores my revelation about the poisoned chicken. He eats the bun with a disgruntled look on his face. He wrinkles his nose every so often. The salty flavor disagrees with him. Later, I hear him throwing up in the bathroom. Maybe there was no way to avoid the poisoned chicken, like the oracle at Delphi. That woman was an oracle. Or maybe he's just dope sick. Tonight I go for a walk in the tenderloin. There are brown stains all over the sidewalks. Where do they come from? Some of them are old chewing gum. They look like polka dots. Wait, are they arranged in a pattern? I don't want to miss anything. Some of them are covered with cardboard. Old bums lie on the cardboard drinking Cisco from a brown bag and leaning against the corner liquor store. One piece of cardboard says Lux on it. Lux means light, and so I follow the light. A dog runs out of a doorway and growls at me. I turn toward him and he wags his tail. I reach down and pet the dog. He has a wound on his neck. The owner appears menacingly in the doorway and kicks the dog, nearly clipping my face. I keep walking. Ghostly women haunt the hallways whose doors open out onto the street. Nice bag of water. Want a nice bag of water? Late night. Satellite. Late night. Satellite. Hey, Duncan. I keep hearing my name. The tenderloin is creepy, so I head toward Union Square. The crowds of tourists are dwindling. A cable car passes me on Powell Street and the conductor shouts, Duncan! Why do I keep hearing my name? Is somebody trying to reach me? Blondie's Pizza is closing and they drag the trash can out front. There's a whole pizza on top. I share the pizza with an old man who was waiting for it. The pepperoni is still warm. The grease puddles in the middle of each slice, runs down the cheese, and onto my chin. Oh good. They threw away some napkins too. Here's a note about the end of chapter 2. The term nice bag of water was an old term for methamphetamine or speed. And late night satellite refers to two things that somebody would be selling. Late night is that they stole a bunch of the transfers off a bus and a late night transfer works all night long and you can ride the buses for free. The other is satellite, which was a satellite number, something that may not make any sense to a younger generation, but 
What it was was a number that you could punch into a payphone and it would let you call anywhere in the world. They usually lasted for a day or two before somebody figured out what was up and shuts the card down. Sometimes you buy the card and it doesn't work at all. Anyway, that's what late night satellite refers to. And you may hear it again in this book because it's a pretty popular thing to hear in the 80s in San Francisco. 